Carl Holmes and introduce him to you. For those of you who don't know Mark, which is probably nobody, um, Mark is a very talented Montreal-based urban sketcher, art instructor, author of several books, and a studio artist. And today, Mark's going to talk to us about his journey from urban sketcher to studio artist. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Brenda. <laughs> well, okay, yes. Hello, everybody. Yeah, we thought, uh, you know, given this time while we're all uh, sitting at home, it'd be a good time to kind of look back and talk a bit about uh, the process, like this from painting on location, uh, which I did for many years with Urban Sketchers, to painting in the studio, which I'm doing now. So yeah, um, I got a whole bunch of stuff around that I'm gonna do show and tell with, I guess. And are we gonna take questions, Brenda? Yes, we are. So um, I first met you in Parachi, Brazil, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Like, I think on a beach in Brazil um, during the symposium that was held there. And at that time, you were doing some really beautiful um, watercolors, um, very traditional kind of watercolor, straight to watercolor, gorgeous. Um, and so today, you're going to start off by talking about your one week, 100 people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, so I've been doing urban sketching for a long time under that name. And of course, I was a correspondent on the website, uh, starting when I lived in San Francisco, but then when we moved to Montreal, we, we kept it up. And uh, I mean, that whole community of this online thing where we get to draw together and, and experience the world through drawing, it's really been sort of my second education. Uh, I mean, obviously I went to school and I took graphic design and I was working uh, doing computer games and art directing. And the ability to go out and draw in the world was just life changing for me. So it was great. I mean, we met you at one of those Urban Sketchers events, Brenda, mm -hmm. and uh, probably a lot of other you, of you in the chat uh, at Urban Sketching events. It was really great to be able to get all over the world and go see these places because we had this group of people working together. So yeah, so yeah that was life changing for me. And I went through this whole phase of sketching and drawing constantly, like obsessively. And it's sort of my personality that it's a, uh, I have to learn things by doing them, by, yeah. by experimenting with them. So uh, I was doing a lot of tinkering and figuring out how I'm going to, how to do this, because it's not that easy to capture the world. And um, it all ended up being on, to the, on this blog as a way, or my blog, citizensketcher.com, as a way for me to sort of focus all my thoughts. And so then that naturally came out as a book. So that's my, my first book was The Urban Sketcher. Does that read right, right ways or backwards? It, it reads the right way for me. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, that was my first book, The Urban Sketcher, which was sort of a collection of everything I learned from that street drawing. Um, and eventually I moved on to, to painting and watercolor. So it's sort of like, I think it's like a, a natural trend that you start with drawing because it's closer to writing. Everybody's used to a pen. Everybody's used to their handwriting. And so I think it's natural to start with drawing. So, uh, yeah, and I, I, okay, so that was so that's a little bit of the, you know, that's why I got into sketching and why it took over my life for so long, that sort of aggressive learning. Um, mm -hmm. and I wanted to keep up with that, even when I had to, um, stuff happened in life and I pulled back from urban sketching. I, I didn't have the opportunity to travel anymore, but I still wanted to keep doing the group activity stuff. So I did start a couple of online events. So we have two of them. Uh, one is called One Week, 100 People, which is pretty much what it sounds like. It's like a challenge to draw 100 people in a week. Yeah. And uh, so I find that to get that done, you pretty much have to be drawing constantly because uh, nobody has that much free time except me because I'm uh, ungraciously retired early. But, um, you know, so I would, I would carry around sketchbooks with me everywhere. Little, just little sketchbooks like this and just yeah. be drawing constantly in my pockets. And, uh, you know, just, just little pen and ink drawings. Carrying, you, if you carry one pen or two pens, I would carry a brush pen for the darks, like in there, and the, uh, just a little fountain pen with a fine line. You, so two things in your pocket in this little book, you can be drawing at any second. You see somebody interesting and you can whip the book out and, and just sketch. Yeah, okay, so one week, 100 people, that's the first event, and these are these little sketchbooks. And you can just see in the bottom corner my little ultrafine fountain pen and the brush pen that I use. So uh, it's really pocket, pocket sketching. And I think this is the first thing that everybody should start with, is just drawing in pen and ink, uh, black and white. And uh, I had a teacher in school, when I first went to art school, he said, we're gonna spend the first year with nothing but charcoal. 
Wow. I was just looking at Laurel's off in the corner. She's framing paintings over there. She said, just, we're going to spend the first year in nothing but black and white. And it, it really is the best way to learn, I think. Drawing is the most instinctive thing. And then when we have just the brush pen and the line, you have nothing but the thickest mark and nothing but the thinnest mark. So it stops you from kind of agonizing. You go from your drawing to just bold shapes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I like to concentrate on, on the storytelling. You want to flip to the next one? Yeah. So uh, the idea with One Week 100 People was to go out and find things, find interesting people, find experience your life through sketching. So I went to the courthouse and I started drawing people uh, on, on trial there. So there was a big uh, event to do with um, uh, smoking. There, the Canadian government was bringing to close a 20 year case against the cigarette companies. Wow. So I, I sat with the journalists. So I was sketching these guys where they were frantically transcribing what was happening in the court. So he's, this guy is like writing his article for the whatever he's Washington Post or the you know whatever he represents. So when you have a story like that, it, it's a fascinating thing. Like it's kind of cool. You're here right in the middle of these events. It's great to be able to just get it down quickly, just draw as fast as you can. So this is a, sort of an example of a continuous line drawing. Mm -hmm. You don't even really pick up the pen. You just keep scribbling. And this idea that I call it heads and hands. So I like to draw the person, of course, because you want to capture the person you're drawing but then I like to draw what are they doing so I like so I draw their head and then what their hands are doing and that I find that automatically tells the story if you just think of those like getting those two things so you so you're saying you do the head and hands first and then the rest of it if you have time you'll just do some yeah, exactly wow so like, yeah. yeah so as long as you get the head and the hands you've got the story who are they what are they doing wow the rest the rest you fill in if you have time yeah. This was on a little 15 minute break or whatever. So the journalists start typing like crazy and then they stop typing as much while the important people are talking. Wow. So it was kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, cool. What do I have, ne do I have next? Uh, this is just on the subway. But uh, the reason I, I like this page, I mean, it's a, a neat sketch of these guys, but I was learning a lot about drawing uh, real people and their clothing. You know, I, when you go to art school, you do a lot of. Um, drawing the, the model, the, the nude model usually, right? So switching to drawing clothing, is, I think is a great way to capture characters, learning how to draw hats or whatever. But so here's an example of drawing by thinking like painting. So I, I like to draw silhouettes of these people, like this guy standing up uh, in the subway there. So you see I have the silhouette of his hair shape and the silhouette of his clothing shape and then the face is just some dots in between. So. Uh, with the other fellow really trying to work on the silhouette of his hat that get the shape of his head. So yeah, this thing about thinking about shapes and then composition. So when you only have the pen, it's so easy to just, you don't get bogged down. You just have the thin lines and then I can concentrate on other things. So mm -hmm. like the way these two ladies are stuck underneath the guy's arms on the crowded subway, yeah. positioning it so that her face is just touching his hand or the other girl is, her, you can just see her eyes above her book. Um, I just love capturing those kind of little details. And mm -hmm. I don't want to get uh, bogged down in rendering, like shading or, or coloring. So that's what's great about the simplicity of painting. It's really amazing how much detail you can get into this little sketch with so few lines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah. I'm trying to make every, every shape meet the other shape next to it and, and form that uh, Assemble collage. Yeah, I think that's really good. It's good training for painting. Mm -hmm. So what, what do I have next? So this is just another one. Um, I guess I just put this page because there's a bunch of nice portraits, but this was a meeting somewhere. So it's my, my version of meeting doodles. I like to draw uh, somebody that's an interesting character and then just start adding people. So thinking about leaving little gaps. So I draw the big guy first, then the second largest guy, and then I start filling people into the holes. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can do your, you can make your page interesting by leaving gaps and then joining the gaps with smaller elements. Because a sketchbook page isn't, doesn't have to follow one kind of perspective. Yeah. So Mark, if I can ask you, when you're doing a drawing like this, are you thinking line or are you thinking shape? Uh, well, it's, I like to call portraits two shapes, that it's the head shape and the hair shape. Okay. 
So I'm trying to, so with this, the, the main fellow here, I drew his contour, the shape of his profile as sort of one line, uh, and then the cut of his hairline. The other guy, you can, you can see it just as well, that the, the drawing where the hairline goes around the ear, it makes a solid shape. Or if you look at the simple guy in the background on the far uh, right, mm -hmm. his hair is just sort of this toque shape, like a watch gap on his head. Right? Or, and with the, the lady with the dark hair, she has no face. It's just the shape of her head and the shape of her hair. Mm -hmm. So if you get those two things right, then filling in all of the details like their eyes and nose and mouth is just uh, like gilding, right? You've got That's the amazing. shape right. Like where that, the large guy has that double chin. If you get that shape right, then filling in the, the details like he's got a mustache and scraggly beard or whatever, that just comes uh, easily because you have the shape. Yeah. So, yeah, so I like to think of the simplest lines first. So everybody is drawn like the guy in the way in the background, just as two little lines and then the details come on down. Yeah. So cool. But, so this idea of this project, One Week 100 People, was to, uh, to challenge people to, to do this kind of continuous sketchbook work because this is, how, I think, how you learn is by doing it day after day, repeated practice. Mm -hmm. If you only draw once a month or every couple of months, I don't think you click into your brain like the learning doesn't seem to happen without repetition. I mean, it's just like when you were in school, they would say you have to, study, you have to take your notes in class, and then you have to study your notes again, and you study them again, and then every time you revisit that bit of learning, it gets stuck in your brain, right? Yeah. So if I can get you to sketch every day, even for just a week, you will learn more than spending however long, a year, sketching casually, I think. Yeah. Yeah, cool. it's like bursts of learning. Yeah. Cool. So uh, uh, I don't wanted to show these accordion books for a bit. Uh, can you flip back to me? Yeah. Just to show people how they work? Yep. That's you. So if I talk, that's me. So yeah, so these uh, kind of accordion books. For a long, long time, I drew on these guys. They're, they're just sheets of watercolor paper that are cut, uh, cut into four and folded. Mm -hmm. and they make a book, a uh, double-sided book. So oh, this, wow. is, this is the back side, some life drawing, and then the front side, uh, sketching around town. And the reason I love these little books, just like I love these scrapbooks, is that you don't feel like you're under stress to do an amazing drawing. You know, you're just drawing on a scrap of paper. So you can, you know, have less pressure that you're going to ruin your sketchbook. Right. <laughs> yeah. This, I always had this, when I get... Too many bad drawings in a sketchbook, then it's dead to me. I can't work in it anymore. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I know that feeling. And, you know, I remember something about you, and that is once I was looking at your sketchbook, and, um, and I opened it up, and, and I realized, oh, this, is, this sketch has been glued into the sketchbook. <laughs> you had glued a sketch mm -hmm. into the sketchbook, and I thought, oh, that means that he's covering up a bad sketch. Wow, if Mark Terrell Holmes makes bad sketches, then I guess it's okay that I make bad sketches. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, it's not good to be worried about it and only show good stuff because it makes that false feeling everyone is good, right? Yeah. So yeah, uh, tape one over top or one I got from uh, another urban sketcher. I can't remember who showed me this, but maybe it'll come back to me, was to just tape two pages together so when you're flipping the book, you just go buy those bad ones because they're taped together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, um, do we have a close-up of that accordion? Yep. yep. Okay. Let's see if we can find that now. So that's uh, beautiful. Uh, you can just see the little tiny palette that I use in the corner there, and some pocket brushes in the bottom. Um, so uh, it's all about packing light. That's the other reason I like these, is because even the the cover of the sketchbook, if it's a hardcover book, is adding weight to your bag. Yeah. Well, I ended up finding these really miniature palettes. Uh, they're a company called Expeditionary Arts, uh, or I believe she calls it her, the equipment is called Art Toolkit. These little tiny miniature palettes. So it's art-toolkit.com, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if you Google around for that, you'll find it. And uh, she also has a site called Expeditionary Art because the woman who makes these, she invented them because she goes to like the Ant Antarctica or the South Pacific and places where she, every gram of her bag is, uh, is important. So they're the, the smallest possible palettes. So yeah, I would, I would carry these around to tint these full sketches. And I sort of believe 
I do a lot of drawing in the moment as fast as possible and then tinting later. So you can go, you get your drawing done and then you can go to a cafe and, uh, and color afterwards, like coloring your own coloring books. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if yes. you flip over, like, there's a close up of this. Oh, you're going, you're zooming in on the palette. Yeah. I'm zooming so that people can see this gorgeous, gorgeous yeah. sketch. Okay. Mark, I'm such a big admirer of your work. Really, I am. <laughs> Thank you. It's Thank you. just so gorgeous. I really try to keep the pen drawing as loose as possible because the color is going to fill the shape. So there's a tendency to want to draw every little bit of the contour and like close the drawing. Yeah. I like to leave it open so the lines don't connect because the color will seal the shape and then the marks are floating on top of it. So it's like... In this, in this uh, sketch of this person, you can see that it's not closed. That's what you mean? Right. Like There's a gap at the bridge of their nose or the side of their face. Yeah, it's almost like a bit of a highlight as well. If I leave these little gaps in the ink line, then I know where they are in the, co in the color. In the mm -hmm. And um, t let me ask you a question about your loose, loose lines. Do you have a special way of holding your pen? Like, are you holding it way down at the end? I know if you're up mm -hmm. close to the end of your pen they're just going to get small and tight yeah yeah i do tend to hold them well this is a brush in this case but i do tend to hold them three quarters back uh, mm -hmm. somewhere like there and then often i'll uh, i'll put my my pinky down on the page yeah so my so i have a, like a bridge like if you're uh, what do you call it if you're shooting pool you have a bridge so you have, yeah i'm trying to demonstrate that and get into the camera you have your pinky down and and then you can keep the brush angle yeah. But yeah, a lot of times, or sometimes I'll even bridge, literally like pool, put my wrist down. Yeah. Literally like shooting pool, and then yeah. I can keep the, keep the brush loose that way. Yeah. yeah. But in terms of a pen line, uh, would you recommend holding it farther, farther back so that it's not, uh, yeah, not yeah, so Yeah, 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 yeah. If, if, you, if you cramp up like writing, then the motion of the line is this big. But if you're back here, then the motion of the line is this big, right? Mm -hmm. And I also find you can you can switch from a very thin like line drawing kind of line and then put it on its side and, and sweep a larger shape. So, you know, you have more choice, more flexibility. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, These brushes, it's always a bit nerve wracking is to get them back in their case without yeah. bringing the hair back. <laughs> That's right. All right. So should we look another at another sketch? Yeah. What else do we have? Okay, so yeah, that's uh, this is some characters from One Week, 100 People, 2017. So um, this this idea of these loose pen drawings and then just t touching in with the color. So uh, I was talking about how I do a lot of drawing on location. This one is a rehearsal for a, a play. It was a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. So they're all in costumes. So it was, I always look for an opportunity to sketch people in costumes because you know, more interesting than regular everyday life. So what I'm looking at in the line drawings is just giving me what is the least bit of information that I need to remember where the colors go. Right. So you can see the, if we look at the, the, the guys who have color on their faces, I actually draw little outlines of the colored spots. Like there's a, there's a nice clear outline of the highlight on the side of his nose or a little circle around where the shadow under his eye socket goes, the top of his chin there. So I sort of learned to make these contour lines inside the face that are our shadow planes. And oh, after wow. a while, you, they, they read well just as little line scribbles or, you know, when you go to put the color, you remember where the color goes. So you're saying that you are actually make, using line and um, you are circling or um, drawing yeah. the shape of the highlights and the shadows within a face. Yeah, like drawing, rather than drawing a nose, I'm drawing the, the triangular shadow on the side of his nose, that, that one fellow with the cravat on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm, it's almost like I draw little brush strokes. This is where a brush stroke, or in this case, a light stroke would be, I'm like drawing an outline around the shape of the brush stroke. Right. It's, like I keep saying this phrase, drawing like painting. Yeah. So I, I don't like to, to, uh, I don't use cross hatching or um, other types of pen shading. Um, I like to think, uh, just think about the the pen line as being a skeleton for later filling with color. Mm -hmm. So the more I was thinking about color, the less that I would draw. And I guess that's the transition that I'm talking about here is all of this 
this, uh, this practice that you do, if you set yourself this goal, like I'm going to get 100 people in a week, you have to do a lot of drawing. And so that helps refine your process. And yeah. I found myself moving further and further and further away from pen so that I was leaving room for the color. Because if you, if you overdraw it, then you almost don't need to color it. Or when you do color it, it's, uh, it gets over, it gets heavy. Right? Yeah. So my drawings ended up getting lighter and lighter and opener and opener over time. So Mark, um, the one week, 100 people, that's one week of the year where it's, I guess, a sketching challenge, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, what week is that? Uh, it's in May. I'd have to go onto my blog to remember. I think we do it start at May 5th usually. Okay. So uh, if you check out Citizen Sketcher, I've got a page for this event, like a sub page with everything I've done for this event. Uh, you can also just Google that hashtag, hashtag one week, 100 people. Yeah. And you'll, you'll find stuff. We had, I think, 4,000 people do it last year. Wow. Um, so uh, we all do it for that week. And I like to post, you know, just post your count. Like I'm at 57 people. Day two, I got 87 people, you know, so I'm, I know that. I'm on track. Basically, it comes down to 20 people a day, right? Yeah. You worry about it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so where they, do people post their sketches? We use a Facebook group for One Week 100 People, so that's another place. You go to Facebook and look for that phrase, and you'll find the group. Um, because everyone's in various sketching groups, and uh, I didn't want to overwhelm the other groups with traffic to do with this event, so we started our own little side area. Also, because I don't insist that you draw from life. So it's a bit of an urban sketcher's mantra that everything is from actual observation, which is yeah. wonderful. And that leads to stories like the guy in the courtroom filing his, his newspaper story as I was watching. But, uh, but some people can't get out that much. Or, you know, if you have work and you have kids and whatever, to, to, to succeed in the challenge, you might draw from photos. You might draw from movies. Sometimes I'll watch a movie and just hit pause and sketch the characters. Yeah. So that's uh, good that to know. Small. Yeah. We that's good to know. Way. I think especially right now when we're all stuck at home, I didn't realize that you could sketch from photos. Well, I mean, I, I do. And we'll talk about that uh, as I get further on. What else do I have in here? Yeah, I do. I think uh, it's great to sketch from life. And that's what Urban Sketchers is about. And that's what gets you to events like going to see these guys rehearse their, their play. I wouldn't have gone and done it if I wasn't uh, looking for these journalistic events. So at, at this time of life, I was obsessed with getting out and going to places. I drew, a, I don't have pictures of this here, but for this event, I drew a, a keto tournament, martial arts tournament with their judo, judo tournament. Wow. Um, so if you, if you look for this one week, 2017, they're on my blog. Uh, so I would never have gone and done that if I wasn't looking for, what they call reportage opportunities to draw life events. So it really was a, a great, uh, the best kind of learning experience. Yeah. I remember um, you were, you and your group, I think the Urban Sketchers, your, your group is Urban Sketchers Montreal. Um, we're going to sketchy, something sketchy. Dr. Sketchies. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people go to that. Um, Can you tell us what that is? Cause we don't have, I've never heard of it. Okay, we never did it officially, but a lot of people did go to it. So that is um, uh, actually, if you if you go back to me, I have some drawings from that somewhere. Um, oh well, this, so that's this is just life drawing. Sorry, false alarm. Probably don't have any costume ones. So what that is is costumed life drawing. Okay. So uh, we would. So they are. Uh, it's Doctor Sketchy's Anti Art School. And there's somewhat like Urban Sketchers, there's local communities in every town, every oh. region. So if you look for uh, Dr. Sketchy's Anti-Art School Chicago, you'll probably find a local group, or New York, or San Francisco, or whatever. So it's mainly American, but they do have them in other places. So they are always costumed some, in some way, sometimes it's burlesque costumes, because that's where the founders, they came out of the burlesque community. Sometimes it's, uh, a lot of it is theater theater costumes. So we would go to that because it's more fun to draw somebody who's, uh, who's kind of putting on a character. Yeah. I, there was one I went to that was a uh, Dashiell Hammett theme. So the guy was all with a fedora and uh, playing private detective. Uh, so you're drawing these little stories, which is more, more fun than just nude life drawing after a while. Uh, yeah. Less, less just skills. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah, pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. So, so we would called, do that. 
Dr. Sketchy's Anti Arts School. Yep, yeah, because it was started by some models in New York, uh, so it was the Anti Art School. Um, it also, because they encourage drinking and socializing, and it's more of a of a party uh, than a strict learning experience. And sounds and like fun to me. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it's more fun. And you have to think about the the life drawing community in New York is its own thing. They're very picky. There are a lot of artists who are very serious. So people will be like, no talking. And, you know, no shuffling your papers too loud. If you don't get here on time, then you're not allowed in. And they oh, they wow. draw straws for the position so that it's uh, no one fights over who has the best spot. It, it can be because in New York, you can actually sell your paintings. People are there to do work. Yeah. So uh, they started this anti-art school thing that's more of a social activity. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. So that's accordion drawings, accordion books. Uh, just like you get all this random stuff on your books, little scraps of paper. Like this was testing, um, testing some new watercolors at the at the botanical garden, uh, and then on the back of that, and like the botanical garden botany show. But then the back of that, this is uh, I think this is Liz and Amber at an urban sketching event. Wow. So you develop kind of just this random pile of, of papers covered with drawings. And I kind of like the freedom of that. So I totally recommend that kind of relaxed attitude over the sketchbook. Um, oh, cool. And this paper, by the way, just, just to say, this is a paper called uh, Aquarius uh, by Strathmore. So it's a, a very bizarre paper. It has a fiberglass content which uh, means that it doesn't wrinkle when you wet it. So you don't need any kind of support. You can paint on it with watercolor and it doesn't lose its, it doesn't get all floppy. Is there a certain weight to this paper? It only comes in one weight. It's called Aquarius II, like Aquarius II actually, uh, but they only make it in one weight because it's this weird formulation. Um, and, uh, but it's good for pen and it's great for watercolor and it doesn't require any taping because it won't shrink or wrinkle. So and when you I, fold it, it's not going to rip on the fold. Uh, it's not as strong as, say, Yupo, but it is it is fairly sturdy. Um, yeah. yeah. And that was life drawing at the parakeet uh, cage at the zoo. So, yeah. Cool. Okay. So, so um, was, we're going to move on to your next uh, image that you sent me. Yeah, I think I sent you some direct watercolor. Oh, so more characters. More of that one week, 100 people. So uh, I'll do, be doing that again, I'm sure. Uh, or we already finished it for 2020, and I'll show you this year, and we'll do it again next year. Cool. Okay, so direct watercolor, and that's my book, direct watercolor, in the picture there. So this is an, uh, this is a, the next phase of my, my journey, I guess, from the sketchbooker, the guy who was always drawing with a pen and had a pen with him everywhere. I sort of I switched to this uh, to painting watercolor on location, which is what you were talking about when we met. Because uh, partially, I just wanted to have colored pieces, but also it's a question of the urban sketching really teaches you to be the most efficient. What is the least you can carry with you because you've got to haul your stuff everywhere. So I have a, my palette in the corner of that shot. Typically, I'll bring just the palette and a couple of uh, backing boards with paper on them. I use little plastic, it's called Coroplast. Uh, boards to uh, hold my paper so that I can just stand and sketch and the paper's not flapping in the wind. So if I have a drawing board and the, and one brush or two and my little palette, that's all I need. And I carry the water in little, in little, little tiny bottles, little jars of water. Um, so uh, let's see what we have in here. So this is, uh, this is 2018, Direct Watercolor 2018 event. So the thing about this event that we call 30 by 30 Direct Watercolor. Uh, uh, this year, Uma Kalkar is probably going to get in and co-moderate like last year. The thing about this event is the, we're encouraging you, again, a challenge to do for an entire month. One week, 100 people is only a week. But for the month of June, we do one watercolor a day. So 30 wow. years in 30 days. So again, it's this thing that I got out of urban sketching that you really improve drastically if you can do it in these concentrated bursts yeah. where you can work every day. So, I mean, there's a lot of ways to manage that in your life. I and mean, what I do is I, don't, I just don't put my stuff away. So my gear is on the kitchen table. I make, 
I make my apologies in advance to the family. <laughs> stuff is always going to be out, and every day I'm going to get out and go do a sketch. Um, you can you can sort of set things aside for one month, right? Yeah. Or if you're going to draw from uh, from Google Earth, uh, like Google Street Map, Street View, yeah. Or or from again drawing from the movies or TV or whatever. Um, if you leave all your stuff in front of your computer and not put it away, it's just that much easier just to pick it up and start again. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's one thing. And, uh, you know, I, I like to set aside, I'm a big video game player. I make sure I don't have a new video game anytime there that I'm addicted to or and I put aside all TV watching and I'll even maybe stop exercising for that month, but that's cause I'm doing a lot of extra. I don't recommend that, but, uh, just, just set aside the. We, we like to say, if you can set aside an hour a day, you can probably do one sketch a day. Yeah. You'll find that if you set yourself, or even twenty minutes, if you say I'm going to do it half hour before bed, what you'll find yourself doing is then pushing the time. Once yeah. you like going to the gym. Once you say, all right, I'm going to do it, then you do it because you're started. Yeah. So I want you. To, I want to get help people get over that gap of starting. Uh, so that they can experience what it's like to work every day. Because by day five, you're starting to feel this sort of in the zone feeling. And by day 10, you're making these really good paintings. And then later in the month, you get tired and they go downhill, but you learn some other things about frustration. Uh, and often I'll, uh, I, I try to be really ambitious towards the middle and then do fun things towards the end. Yeah. But, uh, so yeah, so I have, I have a couple of these paintings in, uh, these are the sketches. This one is, uh, we'll, see, we'll see it in a minute. But these are all uh, quarter sheet. I find quarter sheet is a really nice size. You know how watercolor paper comes in uh, full sheets and then I cut them down. So uh, quarter sheet is a really nice size for people to do a sketch that has some detail, but it's small enough that you can carry with you. Mm -hmm. so let's get into the, the close-ups that you got there. Okay. And oh, this one's beautiful, by the way. Oh, what okay. is this one? Go go to the next one and it'll be easier to say. So oh. that that's the that's the street corner that I'm standing on. A cell phone shot of this thing. So this weird shape in there is the Snowden um, theater sign. It used to be an old theater here in Montreal, uh, and it's a it's a kind of a Montreal landmark. So I was looking for places in my neighborhood that are unique to my neighborhood. So this this Snowden theater has been around forever. They kept this Art Deco sign. And right now they're building a huge condominium that is going up behind the sign. They kept just the sign and nothing else. And they're building this huge condo so you can live at that location. Wow. But so this is an example of uh, just drawing kind of spontaneously. I started with the sign, like I start with the person's uh, head and hair. I started with that shape, that weird kind of, it's almost like an iron. So once I get the shape of that sign, then I just sort of move out from there and it becomes less and less accurate, but I have the thing that I care about, right? Mm. So the street is very chaotic, but as long as I get that one subject piece and it's in a nice position in the center and it's very cleanly drawn, then the rest of it can be just sort of jumble, right? Yeah. So uh, that's sort of how I handle processing this complex information. And cool. here you're seeing uh, watercolor. So why do I call it direct watercolor? Is the idea that uh, no drawing or as little as little drawing as possible. Yeah. So I'll just draw the shapes with the brush. Yeah. And I always love them when I don't do any drawing at all, when they work. So I would say one out of three maybe work, or sometimes it's less. It's a it, but it's sort of this high risk, high reward thing. If I if I go right in with the brush, the drawing is always more spontaneous. Mm -hmm. If I'm filling in a drawing, the worst case is I've drawn everything and then it feels like I'm coloring a coloring book. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I just want to, I get easily bored. Yeah. I don't, I don't feel the enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And you don't have the freshness of the, the mark. Each mark should be just a clean, like if you were trying to draw those telephone poles and you'd drawn them in pencil, yeah. and then you were filling in, you'd be, restrained in your mind you'd be trying to fill in this little tiny you know and their mark would be stiff so yeah that is so true you're so right um it just i mean when you're worrying about having perfectly straight lines well i always tell my students that don't use a ruler because that will suck the charm right out of your yeah. drawing 
and you you learn to you sort of learn to to draw a straight line. I kind of mimic this. If you've got the brush in your hand, and then you 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 can use the wrist to draw like a nice straight line. So I'll draw those posts like, zip, zip, zip. but which uh, um, Gerard showed us that. And so what Gerard will do is he'll put his finger on the side yeah. of his book. Yeah. Then he does those zip. He moves his finger zip, and then he moves his finger zip. Yeah. So he's got this like track along the side of the book, uh -huh. helping him get the line straight down. Anyway, yes. So, well, these things are really good. This is why people are watching because they <laughs> love these tips. So it's great. Thank you, Mark. Gerard Michel, uh, architect from, I think he's Belgian. He's you amazing. Uh, Gorgeous work. Amazing architectural drawings, just freehand. Just, he I doesn't know. need a ruler to do it all. He's so beautiful. So this is the, uh, this is that exact same spot just turning around looking the other direction and here I didn't draw the cars this is the the carry they call it the decarry it's a freeway that you need to take if you're going from the south shore to the north shore and so it's constantly backed up with cars but uh, I kind of liked the idea of getting an urban scene but turning it like a very urban scene there's nothing worse than a concrete freeway but trying to make these things artistic and yeah, I'm like beautiful. Uh, so I was into this thing that year back in 2018 that I called nothing views. It's a view of nothing. Like if you if you go out to the church and you want to paint the cathedral or I'm painting often I would paint statues uh, in the park. There's this natural subject which is made for you. It's already beautiful. Yeah. So uh, I think a lot of urban sketching gets to be like that. We pick a subject and we go there and we draw that thing. Um, it's much more challenging to try to document your city in a sensitive way, like just walk out onto the street and find something worth drawing. Yeah. Uh, so I was enjoying that at that time. I mean, it's not for, it's not something I would do every day, these drawings of concrete and lampposts, but uh, it's, it's, I was in that mindset of uh, getting out and painting on the street. I think but, you uh, like to set challenges for yourself, don't you? For sure, for sure, yeah. yeah. Like this whole thing about I'm going to do one a day and post it online uh, is all about uh, using the pressure to push yourself forward. Yeah, I actually feel like there's no, there are very few other types of art of human activity that are like art. So in sports, people are training their bodies to do something, and it's all competition and personal best times and you know maximum number of reps or whatever. You're measuring everything. But in yeah. art, we, we don't do that. Yeah. Uh, in dance or music, you have the performance where all of your practice is geared to that moment where you're doing the performance. So I like to have something that's like a way to keep track of what I have to achieve. So a number, like I got to get 30 paintings, one a day, is a way to, to do that. Yeah, yeah. So cool. Here's another uh, incredibly industrial uh, view that I, I was trying to make more charming. Um, that's just driving up the highway. So this is where things, I picked this example because this is where things started to change up for me a bit. You know, because I was under that pressure, I said to myself, I'm doing one a day. Um, you wanna to flip to the next slide, I think. Uh, so that's the photo of the place. We were literally driving by, uh, I'm the passenger, Laurel's driving and I snapped the picture out the car window because I want that view, but I can't stand here on the highway and we had stuff to do. And so in order to get things done, I, I was starting to work from photos, uh, which is after all this time with Urban Sketchers, you have all this mantra that you were really there and you really saw the thing. Um, so it was kind of like a, I mean, it seems silly to even question why wouldn't I do this? Of course, it's easier in some ways to draw from the photo, but uh, I had to get over this. <laughs> We'd all we'd all taken this vow we were going to draw only yeah. authentically from life. We got a tattoo. Don't you have a tattoo? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Urban sketching for life. But the um, uh, so that's the place versus the sketch. And you, I have a little uh, little shot in between is this idea, or of getting the main silhouette first. So that was where I drew the um, the water tower. And if I didn't get that water tower right, then I would start again just toss the drawing and, and start, start another one. So, but once you have that, then nothing else has to be that perfect. You just get the, 
the feeling for the environment because right. you have your subject correctly. Right. So uh, I think if you compare the drawings, you if I didn't tell you that I did this one from a photo, you wouldn't really know. I mean, yeah. when you put it next to the one on the highway, they're, they're done in the same way. I use the same palette, uh, same brushes. Sometimes I'll even put the drawing up on my computer and then stand across the room. Mm -hmm. So the thing is actually the same size as if I'm looking at it in real life, right? I'm not up close to it. Because if you're up close to the photo, you can see too many things. Yeah. You tend to draw stuff you wouldn't, like you get into the lettering on the signs or drawing every tree branch. Uh, so I, I'll even stand back from the photos to simulate that. So, mm -hmm. so I sort of feel like, for me, because I had so much training drawing on location that drawing from photos wasn't really any different. Uh, but it could be, it could be a little bit better because you're in that in the comfort of your studio. Uh, you don't have to when you're. The worst thing about urban sketching is having to find a bathroom. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're like, is this a place I can draw because I'm going to have to leave in 20 minutes? Or where are you going to eat next? Or how much yeah. stuff you have to carry? Or it's too hot? Or it rains? Or, or how safe it is. Right, yes. Uh, it's less of a problem for men because we're dumb. We don't think about these things, but it is true. A lot of the, a lot of female sketchers, they say the thing they like about urban sketching is they get to go out in a group and they get to go do something they wouldn't normally do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember um, I took what, your class in Barcelona and you had us all standing in an alleyway. And the idea was we were to see somebody at the far end of the alley. And as they walked towards you, you had to sketch that person in the time it takes for them to get up to you and pass you. Yep. And, um, and that's like not even two minutes. And um, we were frantically sketching away, sketching away. I was focusing on that and focusing on that. And it wasn't until later I looked around and I realized that we were surrounded by prostitutes. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> well, that's Barcelona. <laughs> Barcelona for you. Uh, In that been, alleyway. Should have been drawing them. They probably had more colorful costumes. Well, they were, they're the only ones that are hanging around for longer. <laughs> well, and uh, there were people pickpocketed at, in that, at that event. Yeah. You become so focused on drawing. So personal safety tips when you're sketching is to uh, keep your bag on the front of your body. So I have my shoulder bag there and my sketchbook on top of it. Mm -hmm. So I can't be pickpocketed. Um, I try to bring as little stuff as possible, but of course I have a phone, so you know, that's in the bag up here. Um, and I, I carry everything on my person. I don't put anything down. No. It's really easy to walk away from stuff, so I, I put everything in my bag on my body. Yeah. And at, in Barcelona, one thing that happened is we were sitting in La Rambla, which is this yeah. big shopping district, and I said, let's sit right in the center because you can see all the people coming. And then the, the cops came and they're like, you can't sit in the center. It's, too busy you have to move so having everything on you you can just and my drawing boards are always taped taped together and the palette is clipped on it then i can just walk away yeah so, yeah all yeah. right let's see what else we have here some more beautiful mark tarot homes sketches Ooh. okay so this is uh it's another photo of the car that i painted later so this is really this transitional time in my urban sketching where i I had stopped writing as much on the blog and it sort of freed me up to this idea that maybe I could, that I don't have to do everything from on location. And plus it was the time pressure of 30 by 30. Uh, and then it was also artistic goals that, that I had. So uh, again, it looks like a street sketch, but this one was done at home from the photo. This is a reservoir actually in Montreal. Uh, so, I mean, it was obviously something before that. I think it was probably military because there was this huge field, parade field behind it. So up on that berm on the side is this giant empty field, which below ground is a water reservoir. Wow. It's part of the city's sewer system or whatever. Yeah. Um, but having the, co the cones out there, those orange cones, is just very typical of Montreal. We have old 300-year-old sewers that constantly need work, so they're always tearing apart the road, and it's just very typical. Um, there's just a little, little, little detail that made it, makes it seem like a street sketch. And what, yeah. I wanted to, what I was trying to do with these, like the freeway, is get this uh, vanishing point into the picture, but not uh, really worry about my perspective, just get the feeling of that perspective so you can see how I've sort of eyeballed it and yeah. again the most important thing to me was the little minarets and towers on that interesting building 
and then the rest of it can be just sort of big shapes. I think if you look at the way I painted the railing, it's very rough. Uh, you know, I just want your eye to go to what's the interesting part of the picture. Yeah. So yeah. I think the rooftops with the how they have these little pointy, I don't know even what you call them on the yeah. rooftops is the thing that's so beautiful about it that just draws you just that tiny little line that you made. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's giving you the focus with uh, there's two things. There's detail and contrast. So I often do this white sky so that the top edge of my building is this dark shape against the white sky. Uh, I do that a lot when I'm sketching as well, because if you wet the sky, then you have to wait for the sky to dry before you can draw on top of it again. So yeah. a lot of times with my urban sketching, you have this white sky. Um, it's a little more graphic, draws the eye. In, the, in my first book, I talked a lot about this kind of, uh, there can only be one subject. So I, I call it the, uh, the gradient of interest, that you want to create a gradation of detail so that your focus point has the sharpest, nicest shapes and the darkest, lightest contrast meeting. And then as you move away from your focus, the detail gets softer. So the trees don't have all the branches and the railing is just some scrubbly mass on the side and everything kind of goes out of focus. And that subconsciously, it's that gradient of what's interesting. You'll look yeah. at the interesting thing. You know? Yeah. Cool. Somebody is asking, um, Barbara, hi Barbara, is asking, um, uh, Mark, do you find it hard to paint during this COVID times? And has your ch style changed because of the issues going on? Well, uh, I mean, I, for a while I was a bit obsessed with the news and uh, that it's getting a little depressing. So we were, we were actually debating, like, are we going to do 30 by 30 this year, which is coming up in June. Uh, and I'm still debating, but I think I'm going to do it. You know, for a lot of people, it's going to be a really bad time, especially some of our friends in the States. So, you know, I'm sympathetic to that. Uh, it's like I don't want to have a party in the middle of, uh, of uh, what's a serious time for people, right? And I think also people don't need this pressure of this academic uh, struggle, like we're going to, we have these goals, we're going to push for these goals, like I don't want to be your personal trainer driving everybody. Yeah. So it might be more a softer, softer, gentler approach, you know? But on the other hand, I was getting really depressed with listening to the news, so I, was, I started painting more yeah, but actually just to have something, you know, to think about that isn't that right. Cause yeah. there's, you shouldn't dwell on these things that you can't control. Right. We are doing our part with isolation and our masks and then you can't dwell on it because otherwise it's just really frustrating. Right. That you yeah. can't do anything about it. So that's what I think. That's what I think. So yeah. I, I was for a while finding it. Yes. That it bothered me. And we, we were thinking maybe we won't, make a big deal, but then I'm thinking, I think it should be something for to get people's minds off of it. Uh, one of the things someone else said about drawing, they said, uh, well, I'm trying to remember the quote, but the gist of it was that the reason they draw is to forget everything else. When you're drawing, you, you can't think about anything else except the drawing that you're yeah. doing. And I, I think that's why it's therapeutic, that all of your mind is occupied with decisions about color and shape and translating what you see into the line. So you don't think about your troubles. You don't think about stress when you're drawing. Yeah, kind of therapeutic in that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good cool. question. Thank you, whoever that was. Yeah. Oh, Barbara. All right. Oh, Mark. My okay, gosh. so here's another example of this thing that last year I was calling, the, or 2018 was calling the nothing view, nothing drawings. It's a drawing of nothing. It's just driving down that same freeway, uh, and there was a good storm cloud. And just on the hill, you can see this little tiny carrot the dot building on the hill and that's uh the saint joseph's oratory which is a famous landmark in montreal yeah they they built this gigantic cathedral church on the crest of the uh mountain mount that's mont royal mountain, mm -hmm. so that it could be seen from everywhere in the city mm -hmm. so uh it's actually kind of a neat view but then it's got these tractor trailers and this sort of industrial this is around the lachine canal which is uh, uh for a long time was just shipping, you know, getting coal barges into the city and shiploads of cattle, et cetera. So now it's a very, it's a very nice residential district, but still has a lot of light industry. And this is Montreal in, uh, 
May, so it's still pretty wintry. Yeah. But on the other hand, on the other hand, I quite like the painting, and it's uh, the painting really is an example of abstracting that to, to the greatest degree. Like the clouds are just watercolor doing what I love about watercolor, and that okay, that's another example of direct watercolor. Just talking about the clouds for a minute. I used to draw the clouds, like I would draw a pencil line around the shape of the clouds. And that means you're filling in to this, this drawing and then you have a line around the clouds it doesn't really look like soft and fluffy, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. when I switch to just drawing with the pen uh, or with the brush, no pen line, then it liberates you to do watercolory stuff. Right? And think about things in terms of shape. So the shape of the blue hill and then just the, all the little staccato white marks of the roofs and the rest of it is just sort of a brownish, the brownish shape of the low rise city. Yeah. 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 So I think that's a really good example of um, turning nothing into, into a sketch. That's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. My gosh. Uh, Chinatown Gate. Um, a, good, a good landmark in Montreal. We have a couple of these Chinatown Gates and I think every city has one of these. Uh, so, uh, I took a couple of tries to get this one, but this is the one I liked. And if, if you go to my blog and look, dig around for the 30 by 30 page, it's all divided into years and you can read the making of. And I showed how I, I, I had a couple of false starts getting this one. Um, but again, this is this idea of taking just any old place and converting it into uh, more of a, a personal view of the thing, spontaneous view of the thing. And it's impossible to draw every detail with the brush. So you get this fused shapes and uh, simplified shapes. And uh, yeah, this was, this was my personal favorite from that, from that year. Um, and, I have so many questions percolating in my mind. I think we're going to have to have a second <laughs> uh, interview with you, Mark, because uh, I just have so many things I want to ask you. I don't want to take up your time. Okay, so we're gonna, well, if anything pops up, go ahead, or if anyone else pages me, don't, don't feel uh, shy to interrupt. So now we're, now we're up to 2020. So that was uh, this sort of going through this business of uh, leaving the pen behind and starting to do just watercolor. So when I came back to my project, One Week 100 People, this year I wanted to do it uh, like a watercolorist instead of like uh, the sketchbooking method. So I think I have, I have some details of that stuff. So I, uh, I did go out with the pen because it is very much an, uh, an event that's popular with urban sketchers. So I wanted to say to people, go out and draw from life. And part of that is because the people you find from life, you would, never, you would never think about. You can't just imagine all these people. You know, like real life will show you things that you never would have thought of. So, getting these characters, like one, this girl with the puffy pants that's number 21 in the bottom right, or in the upper left, there's a woman with a huge fur collar, and then she has these stiletto heels. That's actually very typical Montreal or New York look. Um, there's a guy in the corner that's got a big winter coat wrapped around his gym bag so that he can go to the gym, so he's got this weird bag strapped around him. So all these little details you won't, you'll, you'll get from life. Right? Yeah. So I do definitely believe in that, but I also didn't want to be trying to paint watercolors standing in the subway. Uh, I have done it. I did it the previous year, but I thought, uh, now I'm getting soft while with all this painting in the studio. So what I did was I said, I'm going to go out and get all 100 people on the first day. Uh, so then oh my that, gosh. So then, that, then I'm done for the week and I can say, Honestly, I did it, urban sketching. I did it properly. I'm an urban sketcher. And then I can do all my fun stuff in the studio. So what I, have, I think next I show the, I have the process. So I took all of those drawings uh, and then I redrew them as, as direct watercolor sketches. So in, I'm just taking the brush and just painting in with the brush. And these are very small. The, uh, you can probably just see in the thumbnail view. I have this, these strips of paper where I drew these little guys. So there are five four inches tall maybe. Uh, and so I'm thinking t just about the head shape and head shape, hair shape, I call mm -hmm. that, right? So like, which is often a hat. So you have the, just if I get the head shape and the hair shape and then a silhouette of the body. And inside that, I let the water do whatever the water is gonna do. You know? And uh, 
Yeah, it's just, it's more, it's, it's like a phase that I'm in where I don't have anything to learn anymore from the line drawing. And I, that's not true, but you know, to some extent I'm, I'm ready to not study the line drawing. I want to study painting. Yeah. So, uh, so I sort of moved that whole process up where, yeah. Uh, there's some more of this example of how this works. So th this is not uh, tracing, but uh, just looking at the sketches that I liked and redrawing them. So, you know, uh, in the past I'd be tinting, I'd call it tinting instead of coloring in. So I'd be drawing on top of my ink drawings, but now I'm, I'm redoing it so that I get that whole silhouette effect. Mm -hmm. And you've really stuck to, like I'm seeing maybe three colors on there, like a, a black or a Payne's gray and then an ochre or something and then a, a, a red. Yeah, I use a, a red called um, Perline Maroon for it's sort of a purplish red. It's a bit like um, mm, alizarin crimson, but mm. uh, alizarin crimson was outed a few years back as being really fugitive, that it's a, a, not a light fast color, even though they call it uh, alizarin crimson permanent. Uh, the guy on handprint.org had done some studies and there, he could not find any alizarin that was light fast. So I switched to this perline maroon um, because Jane Blundell told me to do that. Okay. Uh, so if you want to Google Jane Blundell, she is the queen of color. Uh, yes. Her site has got tons of good information on color. Uh, so does this fellow at handprint.org. Tons of great information on pigment science. So anyway, I have this red, alizarin, crimson. I use it with white to make flesh tones. I use a lot of uh, titanium white or buff titanium. So I have the very dark red and I use it with white to make all my flesh tones. And then I have a very a blackish color. It's probably uh, neutral tint and indigo for a lot of these blackish colors. And then again, I use it white. Uh, so I get gouache, white gouache. No, white watercolor. Oh, I didn't know yeah, that. Titanium anything. white watercolor. Uh, for, you can get it from Daniel Smith or Holbein or anybody. Titanium white watercolor or buff titanium is a yeah. nice watercolor. That's a, it's a, a warm white titanium. And then I also have one called Gray of Gray, which is a color by Holbein. And it's the, it's like the lightest gray that isn't white. So uh, it's kind of useful for stuff like those, those bits of gray window in the background. Mm -hmm. So that's the sketch I did on location, which is actually smaller than the drawing and then the drawing I did back in the watercolor I did back in the studio. So, you know, I, again, if I, I think if I did the drawing on, on location, uh, it would turn out the same, but I just would have to carry all the stuff with me. So I sort of feel like I, I've graduated beyond the point of worrying about whether I did it on location, but I want to keep the freshness. So, yeah. uh, and I had taken a snapshot with my cell phone of the environment, um, of the tables and chairs. So I had a little more information and I liked the way that, that she was backlit against the window. Uh, this is kind of a little storytelling sort of element. She was having an intense conversation with somebody or whatever. So I, I uh, quickly sketched her and, you know, you're looking for, for slices of life that are, uh, make little interesting stories, right? Yeah. It's beautiful. I love how the, how the pigments of the, of the paint are, are getting caught in the tooth of the paper. Is it a hot yeah. press or cold press paper? Uh, cold press paper, so there's a little tooth. And then I'm using probably lunar, lunar black, like the moon lunar black, mm -hmm. uh, which is a Daniel Smith color. It's very, um, has a lot of sediment. In it. So it gives you that very textury look. Yeah. Uh, and so then what I, so then what I did at the, at, as the conclusion of this, uh, 30 by or of this one week 100 is these street scenes with people in them. So I went to the, went out into the location I wanted, found the location and just watched people for 20 minutes. And I would, I'm taking snapshots with my phone. And then when I get home, I'm sketching all the people that I saw, thought like picking the best people. Mm -hmm. So rather than just one random view, it's, it's kind of edited. I'm choosing who's the right person choosing where they should stand and to make this composition of the people walking up towards the, the church. Mm -hmm. um, this is people leaving the metro and heading up to downtown. So there's a constant stream of people. Uh, right. Yeah. Oh, wow. okay. And then, uh, and then I did it again bigger. So this one is a, a building they call La Vitrine, uh, the glass house. And so the, it's this big 
arts complex downtown and they it's illuminated from inside so at night the building throws out colors and it strobes from green to red to purple so i sat on the street corner and just snapshotted people as they came towards me because this is how i used to do it when i was drawing we yeah. were talking we talked about that exercise of drawing people as they come towards you down the street so i call that en passant you're you want to sketch them as they walk towards you. And by the time they pass you, they're, they're done, right? But then yeah. the next person is walking towards you. So I might draw uh, someone's silhouette. And then when the next person comes by, then I'll draw their face. Yeah. And when the next person comes by, I might draw their shoulder bag. Yeah. So I'm at, I'll like add a piece from each person that goes by. Um, I remember that from the workshop that I was in with you in uh, Barcelona, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. idea of an amalgam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like how do you how do you deal with all this? Like getting it from life and getting details you wouldn't think of. Like somebody goes by, they have a dog under their arm, and they're drinking their coffee at the same time, and like it's a little detail you wouldn't think about. So you want to get that from life. Yeah. So this is winter. So for Montrealers, they love this. Uh, well, it's actually uh, again, it's May. So that's what <laughs> May in Montreal can be. Quite May cool. in Montreal. Yeah, I know. And everyone is uh, nowadays, everyone has these tight fitted hoods because everyone has these like spandex liner outfits. So locals uh, really responded well to this drawing because that's what it looks like. It's, everyone's got this type of gear now. Yeah. Somebody is asking um, if you could please uh, repeat the name of the very light gray paint that you used. Hmm. So that's a Holbein watercolor and it's called Gray of Gray. Uh, or uh, sometimes you'll see it packaged as Gris a Gris in French yeah um, so it's it's the lightest gray in their line so I consider it a, a dark white so <laughs> I, I have uh, three whites I have titanium white buff titanium and gray of gray so that's a light medium dark white just like I have three greens light medium dark green three red light medium dark whatever so yeah. uh, I like to have three values of each color and so this gris, gris a gris or gray of gray you can put it into anything, like I put it into the scarves on this, uh, these ladies in here, so I'm just adding it to black. Uh, and it, but it's a watercolor, so it, it's not like adding gouache, it doesn't get as chalky. Oh. It'll flow. But it, it is pretty opaque for a watercolor. Yeah. Um, yeah. This so, is gorgeous. So, this, um, Mark, this, this kind of goldy color that I'm seeing down at the feet, um, just mm -hmm. on, on either side of the group of women, mm -hmm. what is that? That's probably uh, a mix of stuff, but it's probably um, gothite is a color I use that's a granular. It's like a, it's like a raw umber, no, raw sienna, so a yellowy brown, uh, but it's more granular. So it's called gothite, gothite. How do you spell that? Like goth, the writer, but gothite because it's a mineral. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, G I had a terrible at spelling. G O E I T E. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow, it's very German. Yeah, it's like Goss, the writer. So, uh, yeah. But it's a mineral. It's also called brown matter, I believe. It's the name of the mineral, but you probably won't find it under that term. So, Daniel Smith calls it Gothic. So, it's an, uh, I like to have a, a clear color and a granular color. So, I'll have uh, in my yellows, I'll use Naples yellow because uh, it's more of a granular yellow and gothite is my dark yellow. So it's probably that because I see a lot of granulation, but then I'll often also put uh, Quinn Orange Deep is a, my version of Burnt Sienna. There might be a touch of that in there. Hard to say. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Uh, it's it's, yeah. it's so, stunning. Uh, I washed that warm, dirty pavement first and then all this shadow is... Uh, white and black together to make this gray. I might have used graphite gray is the color I have, which I use a lot in the city. So graphite gray has graphite in it. So it's a very chalky, opaque gray. Um, but then I tend to lighten it with white. So the difference, the reason I use white is if you lighten a color with white, you still have body, still a, a rich paint that covers well. Mm -hmm. If you lighten it with water, you can get a light color, but you have transparency. Yeah. So there's different times to do different things. So in the background, the lightening is done with dilution, whereas in, in the de denser areas, the lightening is done with, with white. Uh, wow. But it's still watercolor, so it still has all this flow. Yeah. So, it, you know, you really have captured that, the slushy Montreal sidewalk. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's, this, is like a, yeah. this is an event called the Festival Lumiere. Yeah. Uh, so they put these crazy lights out, colored lights out on the street. So the, the Chinatown gate is lit up. Uh, people are coming back from the festival. So they're sort of a girls night out. They're, they're partying and whatever. And I, I knew I wanted to paint this spot because I painted it before. Uh, I was cruising around downtown looking for good views and I knew I'd get somebody and so I just wait till I get the right people. So this is an example, besides that it's sort of the, the climax of my drawing 100 people, uh, it's an example of where I'm going away from urban sketching. So I, it's more like street photography now. Mm -hmm. I found a spot and I'm waiting for the right people uh, so that I can get the composition I'm looking for. So that's, now, not, that's now not really urban sketching, is it? Because you did, you took steps to get the image that you wanted. Right? But I still paint it like a sketch because I still love that spontaneity. Well, I won't tell anyone if, if you know, yeah. if the people on this call don't. Well, you know, I don't, I don't mind, I don't mind. It's like, uh, you know, there's phases of life. And uh, I, I still, oh, and here, this is uh, just to show you, just to go back to that. If I hadn't painted the, uh, the gate, the first time around, I wouldn't have known what to do the second time around. So painting it at night in the, in the dark, and it's much harder to see what's going on. And then, and, and I was working from photo when I got home. Uh, but because I painted it before, I had a memory of how to paint. It. So it's just interesting to see them side by side. This is uh, two years apart cool. at the same spot. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so that's, so what we've been talking about this whole time is this journey from being a sketchbooker who's learning to draw, because before I was an urban sketcher, I was a digital artist, and everything I drew was in Photoshop. Uh, yeah. My professional career was video game design. So I didn't really know how to draw and get it right the first time. I knew how to do digital art where you could fix everything infinitely. So going from this learning to draw to learning to paint and going from everything was walking around doing five minute sketches to then plein air painting to then studio painting, it's just been this natural progress for me. And I, I actually think a lot of people are going to be going through this process. I see a lot of urban sketchers doing a more variety of things, more complex things, because it's like going to university. You, if you're a serious urban sketcher, you're getting more art school than anybody who goes to art school because you're working so frequently. At yeah. such, such challenging situations. People in art school don't try anything as difficult as urban sketching, right? So mm -hmm. uh, it's really this great training. So in 2019, to do this out of order, uh, uh, the 30 by 30 I did that year was all studio, no outdoor location. And I made this book that's called The Apocalypse Variations, which mm -hmm. is my least well-known book besides direct watercolor and citizen sketcher, or urban sketcher. So uh, flip forward in the pictures and we'll see if I can show you how I did it. What, uh, what do I have? So these are uh, all digital sketches done on the iPad. And, I, and then later on, I did a whole bunch of little drawings, uh, little, little drawings on little squares of watercolor paper. Let me, let me uh, stop the share. There we go. Yeah. So uh, these are, this is just these small little six by six or maybe they're seven by seven ink sketches. So I did a whole forest of these, just like uh, there's a stack of these kind of drawings. And plus my, uh, plus the stuff on the iPad. So all of this is using that rapid sketching kind of mentality that we learn from urban sketching, all the kind of pen handling, and they're just abstract compositions, shapes that I don't even know what they are. They just might be a place. And I'm not even thinking about the color. And so using that background we have with sketching to do all these things very, very quickly, then, then I could turn around and blow them up. So I go from what is really just an abstract sketch to the larger, larger painting. So uh, I think I have close-ups that show that. So let's look at this. So the smaller paintings slides. are in ink and the larger ones are in watercolor? Yeah, I did a bunch on the iPad just sitting on the couch. And then these are just, uh, you know, Sumi ink. Okay. ink. With a paintbrush. Uh, yeah, the Chinese brush, uh, probably. And maybe a little bit of dipping pen, but probably not. And uh, yeah, so I made all these imaginary landscapes in the studio because I was thinking about, well, so behind me, this is this progress from painting on the location 
to painting these studio paintings. So I've, I've been thinking about that process. <laughs> Laurel's handing me the book. Here's the, here's the book. Yes, and this book is available on, can you open it up and give us a few uh, in sure. interior uh, pages? Uh, it's available on Amazon. Yeah, all my books are on Amazon. So all 30 of the drawings from 30 by 30, uh, paintings from 30 by 30 are in there, yeah. along with some close-ups and a little bit of discussion about the, the thinking process, like what yeah. I was thinking about when I was doing these. And uh, I do some close-up details and uh, there's a little bit of how-to, but it's not an art book like the other ones, other than describing how the series was made and showing, showing the thumbnail next to the finished painting. Right. So all the how-to is on my blog, but the book is more of the personal journey. Um, it's a little bit philosophical, it's a little dark. So these, store, these paintings are dark, as you see. Uh, it was a bit of a phase, you asked me about COVID, but at the time, as a landscape painter, thinking about the environment, some of that stuff gets kind of depressing. Thinking yeah. about, uh, <laughs> it so happens right now, there's a fire in Chernobyl that's sending <laughs> radioactive dust all across Europe. Uh, that's the kind of stuff I was thinking about with some of these darker paintings. Yeah. So I apologize for that. But if you, uh, if you have a mind uh, to be interested in maybe those subjects or uh, just the watercolor itself, that little book has got an interesting collection. Um, cool. so I, uh, it was a, uh, if we have some, just see the slides and I can talk in general over the slides. What I wanted to, to do that year in, in 30 by 30 was sort of show how you could use a con, uh, concerted project like this to, to set yourself a task, like doing all these little sketches. And I think I did 60 so that I could have some to choose from close. And then, um, and then uh, produce all the art over the, the month. And then I packaged it up and, and put it into the book on Amazon. Wow, that's so, amazing. Yeah, so it was done in, a, in six weeks because uh, it took a little time to get the book together. Um, but I, I wanted to sort of, I, the thing about this project, 30 by 30, is to show you what it feels like to be working day by day yeah. and how a series can progress your work. So by, by putting it all together and actually packaging it and shipping the sketchbook, it's sort of uh, it's a nice closure in the whole thing. Uh, There's so a discipline to, involved. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's like a, like a, a, well, it's like a marathon, I guess, that you're, you're training for, you have to train for a marathon, you have to practice your ability to do that kind of running and then there comes the performance where you execute the marathon and then it becomes a matter of grit yeah. staying with it uh, not every one of these paintings would turn out right but right. by by doing all the little sketches i put the worry of whether the composition was going to work on the disposable drawing yeah so that's like my little people scribblers that if the drawing or my accordion books if it's an unimportant little sketch, then you have this mental freedom. And then later, when I'm translating it, uh, then I have this at least that much to work from. Right? Mm -hmm. So, and then watercolor, of course, is also just very fast. So these watercolors are really textural, uh, really uh, a lot of pouring. I would mix small cups, little 15 mil, mil cups of colors. So that wow. I could, uh, bring the color right onto the page. And so that I could mix it um, thick enough. That I, uh, I I like to call watercolor tea, milk, or honey. Yeah. So tea, of course, if you think of tea, it's transparent. It has some color in it, but it's transparent. And uh, whereas milk is more uh, juicier paint mix, but then honey is almost sticky, sticky like consistency. So when you're making the honey, you put your brush right into the the dab of watercolor, right? and just pick up some watercolor and put it on the page. That's why I like to use tube color instead of pans, because you can just take a wet brush and scoop out some color and spread it on the page. So you can't do that over a big area, that honey, uh, larger painting. So I would mix in these little cups with a toothpick to get you know, a decent amount of this, this very rich pigmented color. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So uh, I think I have a few more of those just on the slides. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Somebody is asking, are you using the same paper for the larger paintings, the Aquarius? Yeah, uh, I do. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. The Aquarius. No. Excuse me. The Aquarius I recommend for those uh, accordion books because it's, uh, it's got this property of it doesn't ripple. So it's really good for field sketching. 
but it's only 90 pounds. It only comes in the one weight. Um, and it doesn't uh, take texture as well. But it's really better for that kind of tinting kind of stuff. So these, this, these pictures here happen to be uh, 140 paper, 140 pound paper, but I've subsequently switched to 200 pound. So uh, it's Fabriano, um, I think the line, it's our Fabriano Artistico, mm -hmm. is I believe the line of the paper. And they have a 200 pound, so it's in between the 140 and the 300 pound. So these are American terms, we say pounds. I think, I think it's 500 grams. 200 pounds is 500 grams, but anyway, it's 200 pounds in, in, in North America. So I, I get, again, I get 300 pound paper is so nice, I get nervous when I use a piece of it. Like I'm gonna wreck this really nice expensive paper. So I switched to the 200 pound because it's a nice compliment. And uh, so that's this Fabriano that I, I quite like. Cool. So I'm gonna ask you uh, It's just showing you the sketch versus the, uh, sketch versus the finished painting again, the idea of, translating my throwaway sketches. Yeah. yeah. Uh, somebody's asking a question. <clears throat> I'm not sure I'm understanding <clears throat> the question uh, very well myself, but I'll just throw it out there and we'll see what you have to say. <laughs> a watercolor artist is more abstract and architect sketcher is more detailed. How uh, is, does an urban sketcher find his or her evolution or path? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I really think it has to come with their background. Or it, people tend to fall into these categories of what they like. Yeah. Uh, you'll, you'll run into architects that can draw pers amazing perspective, like Stephanie Bauer, who's taught perspective for probably 15 years or something, probably 20 years. She's just can draw anything accurately instantly, right? So for her, it's a, uh, it's natural. She's done it so much. It's second nature. She's like has a has master's knowledge. I don't yeah. have that master's knowledge of perspective and I don't have that patience to build the drawing carefully. So I gravitate to what I like, which is more expressive marks and a, an approximation of what's there. I, I do have some stuff in some of my courses about how all the ways that I can cheat around perspective, not do it properly. Uh, so, you know, people gravitate to what they like. Whereas if you, if you took my kind of approach and you started doing these spontaneous drawings and you didn't like it, like you were embarrassed at the results, so you didn't want to show it to anybody because it didn't look real, <clears throat> that's totally fair. That's, it's totally fair to say, I don't actually want that. That's not what I like in a drawing. So you should feel free to draw these kind of precise kind of things. Like, I, it's not a judgment that abstractness or uh, you know, loose creativity is better. It's just what I like. Yeah. Or I look at those guys like uh, Gerard Michel, and I'm like, amazed that he can make this. He can draw, uh, he can look at a building and then draw what it looks like, looking straight up from the ground. Yeah. But he's not there. He's looking at it across the street, but he, in his mind, he can project the entire building into 3D. Like, it's an incredible ability. I yeah. Wish. So I suppose if I loved that, I would be, I'd be banging away until I learn it. But, yeah. But you tend to, I feel like you can only do the things that you enjoy because it's hard enough and you're doing it for nobody else but you in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so you gravitate to what's, people will say, I don't have the gift for that. But I say it's, you don't have, that's just not what you're impressed by. Yeah. I want to get something where I can show my friends and say, isn't that amazing? And I, you know, if I like it, then that's the goal, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And cool. So one, well, sure, yeah. I think I think that's I think that's that. I think that's how that that's the answer to that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, what do we have here? This is okay. So this one, uh, that's this that's the digital. It happens to be a digital sketch. Uh, I did a bunch of them on the couch on my iPad. Same process as the ink drawings. Uh, and then the next slide will be comparing it to the painting. Uh, or th that's the painting in watercolor and the reason oh, I'm showing and this is the um, painting that's right behind you You're right and that's why I'm showing you that one that, it, that if we if we so that's so I did the little sketch I did the watercolor and then subsequently I've been painting them in oils oh so, I'm sorry you're saying this one this one that the we're looking at in the screen is watercolor and the one behind you is the oil one behind me is the oil painting so that's, wow yeah. so I've been been, been enlarging these Part of the reason that I went to oil painting is, is the size. Yeah. So, uh, and this one is uh, 30 by 30 inches, mm -hmm. not to be confused with 30 by 30 watercolor. 
but uh, I've been trying gradually getting bigger. I've done a couple of four foot ones. So it's very hard to do watercolor at that scope. Again, you have to mix your colors into buckets and pour the color to, to get it to do that kind of scope. And it's just hard to find paper larger than a certain size. So uh, uh, the oil offers you these opportunities of scope and then the texture, which you can't see the texture here, but uh, if you, on my Instagram, I have a lot of texture close-ups of these oil paintings. I kind of, I used Instagram for the oil paintings, whereas I use the blog for this. So that's uh, m.homes.art on Instagram. Uh, if you go to, if you Google me, you should be able to find me. Uh, I'm sure that link is also on my uh, bio somewhere on my, on Citizen Sketcher. Uh, so I, you can see the close-ups of what these surfaces look like up close. They're all done with this three-dimensional kind of impasto, which you don't have in watercolor. The opportunity to uh, you know paint with thick paint and to scrape the paint and cut into it with a palette knife for instance scraping away at it so i was doing more of that textural surface with those watercolors you thought saw and it sort of graduated into this idea of doing doing these bigger oil paintings and, and i took uh, a year off urban sketching for various personal reasons, we had illness in the family, et cetera. But uh, also I was doing oil paintings in the studio. And so this is the kind of stuff that came out of that year of self-study um, that came out of all the sketching that I did. Like I wouldn't have been able to just sit down and, and then start teaching myself oil painting if I hadn't have done all the urban sketching beforehand, which is sort of the whole message of what I'm talking about today. So that, that you start with these little books and train things like composition and seeing shapes with the simplest possible tools. And, right. and you have to allow it to build on itself over time. Uh, whereas if, I think if you dive into, just dive into the painting, it's, it's going to be, if you don't have the fundamental skills of drawing with the brush and seeing the shapes in your mind, it's just going to be harder. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Do we have more images to show here, Mark? Uh, no, I think that, that is the, that's, that now we're up to present day. Okay, that's the last one. Yeah, that's well, what I'm doing now. <laughs> thank you so much. I we just, but <laughs> believe it or not, we just had somebody join the call. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, they'll have uh, to watch it on the replay on your uh, YouTube channel. Yeah. Thank you, Mark, so much for um, coming into uh, our meeting and chatting with us today and uh, sharing with us your art. Try to get us both up here on screen. Yeah, thanks um, for inviting me. That was very nice. Yeah. And so everybody think, who tuned in from all over, thank you very much. Yeah. We had a lot of people come into the call today and they really, um, I, oh, I learned a lot and I'm sure they learned a lot as well. It's just really cool to see your process from, um, from urban sketcher to a uh, painter. I just wanted to let people know that Mark has uh, these three books available. I have one here, the urban sketcher, and that's available at Amazon. Is that right, Mark? Yeah, or, or retail stores. Yeah. And then uh, Direct Watercolor is uh, my own self-published book about these types of watercolors. Yes. And, uh, which is on Amazon. And then also the Apocalypse Variations Project from 30 by 30. And so those two are available at your blog or? You can find the links on my blog to go to Amazon. You can also uh, Google, just Google my name on, like type my name into Amazon. I have an author page there. Mm -hmm. um, so these are my books, self-published. Uh, the Urban Sketcher is worth is with uh, Random House now, um, so that's that's also in bookstores. Whereas my books, you'll find on Amazon. I think I think I forgot to ask you: Are you selling your original watercolors and oil paintings? Certainly do. Yes, I'm. Uh, that's the goal: is to move towards galleries. I don't have a gallery representation at this time because yeah. uh, you know it's a process, and it's hard going out there for art ga for uh, retail galleries right now. It's tough. Yeah. Well, so uh, I have a website for that, which is just marktarohomes.com. Yeah. Uh, where you can see all the paintings that I'm offering for sale. And uh, yeah, you know, all these things are, are definitely linked. If you start with Citizen Sketcher, you can read basically everything about uh, art and drawing. That's all the how-to. Yeah. Marktarohomes.com is just a portfolio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah yeah well i have really enjoyed your book i mean i you can see i've got bookmarks in it and i've gone all through your book and and read it and it was wonderful i re, i mean i thank really you. learned a lot from your book well thank you so, yeah 
Yeah, thanks, yeah. Mark. Um, so everyone, um, I just want to let you know that we have now three online workshops available at Studio 56 Boutique. Oliver Holler's Design on the Fly is available there, and we have another one by Ian Finelli called Layers of Looking, and my new online workshop was just uh, launched last week, um, Beginner's Perspective, where I talk about one point, two point, and three point perspective. And so check us out, www.studio56boutique.com, and look at the pull-down menu called Online Workshops. Um, and also we have more online workshops coming up really soon. I won't tell you, it's, it's very exciting. Um, the date and guest of our next live streaming interview is still to be determined, so check back at Studio 56, our Facebook page, and uh, look for us on Instagram, it's gonna be posted there. These interviews are recorded, so for the people who arrived really late to this interview and, and have missed most of it, I'm gonna try to get that uh, recording edited and on YouTube um, very soon, in the next few days. Um, I just wanna thank everybody who popped in and uh, and, uh, and I wish you all well. We're all uh, in this together, quarantining and going crazy and making beautiful art. And I hope that you're encouraged. And I want to thank especially Mark Terrell Holmes for chatting with us and sharing his beautiful artwork. Mark, do you have any last words you'd like to say to anyone? Oh, just uh, as you say, thanks for coming. And it was great talking to everybody. I hope that uh, you are using art to get through this time. And and uh, I hope you're posting online because it's really motivating to share your work with other people. It is. It is. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you, Mark.